Atheist Nomads, episode 93, The Satanic Temple with Lucian Greaves. Atheist Nomads is proudly brought to you by Archway Hosting. Check out their low-price, full-featured hosting solutions at archwayhosting.com. That's A-R-C-H-W-A-Y hosting.com. Hey, we're also brought to you by listeners just like you. Find out how you can become a patron at patreon.com forward slash Atheist Nomads. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com forward slash atheist nomads as a concerned parent of the uh, free thought community i want to advise uh, atheist nomad listeners that this is an adult show there will be things discussed talked about topics that may be inappropriate for children under the age of 25 40. 26 27 yeah. 40 <laughs> We are the Atheist Nomads, bringing you history, science, politics, religion, and interviews with leaders in the atheist community. Not all those who wander are lost. Welcome to another episode of Atheist Nomads. This is episode number 92. I am Dustin. Joining me as always is Wesley. Hey there, man. And one thing I need to start before we, we get to the interview is we, we've covered uh, stories from, from this particular group quite a few times, the uh, Satanic Temple. And when it comes up, it's always been one of those where, you know, I, I kind of want to not like them, but it's hard not to because they keep on coming in on the right side of things. And I just have to wonder, well, why? Well, to help answer that, we have Lucian Greaves with us. Hello. <laughs> yeah, I, I admit I'm I'll fanboy a little bit. <laughs> but anyways. Yeah, this is pretty pretty freaking awesome, all the, the, the stuff that you do. Thank you. Yeah. We're definitely. hard at work. Yeah. So I guess the place to start, uh why why are you going with the approach that you're going? Uh why the, the satanic temple and not something else? Well, because this is what we feel it is. I mean, we're 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 the uh, the opposition in a lot of way to the majority religious voice, and the perfect icon and iconography for that comes from Satanism, and it's definitely something a lot of people uh, gravitate to within our organization. The way they don't gravitate towards anything else. So a lot of people came up in a religious environment. For the most part, everybody came up in a judeo-christian um Mm -hmm. construct and so this this is deeply resonated for them in a certain way where they embrace the the blasphemy and when they're coming out of supernatural beliefs and they they kind of embrace that and see that there are no repercussions to it and there are there's a lot to be said for uh questioning traditional values or uh moral norms that are put forward so um, even though we don't subscribe to any supernatural belief, the, the Satanism part is is very much something that that resonates for us in a genuine way. I could definitely understand where you're coming from on that. You know, I, I mean, I am a guy that has a zombie Jesus and zombie Mary on my arm all the time. So, yeah, it's it's, it's always a, it's it's always a leap to to embrace that at a certain point too, and for you know, especially when. When you know you might be g- growing up with certain notions that doing this to yourself brings uh, the wrath of a supernatural fury upon you, mm-hmm. and, and then when you start discovering how how moronic those kinds of claims are, how that's not true, and how those those beliefs themselves are actually harmful, um, you know that that can have a profound effect on somebody. And some people, you know, yeah, uh, yeah. contextualize that uh, as part of their religious belief thereafter. And I think that's where where we come from yeah i know i had a when i was leaving religion i had a a harder time letting go of the fear that satan was trying to take me away from god than i had a fear of losing my belief in god right Uh, right and and i I feel like the uh the belief system itself is is constructed in that very way and i feel it's it's a very liberating what we do A, a lot of people see that as kind of backward because the uh the the symbolism and then 
the the story of Satan rooting back to Christianity itself. But but I don't see it that way. Of course, we really embrace the literary Satan, and, and the Bible is really quite contradictory on who the character of Satan is. You know, in the mm-hmm. Book of Job, he's in good standing in God's court. They have something of a gentleman's bet in, in about uh, Job's uh, loyalty to God and play this little game. It's, it's later on the Christian demonology that Satan comes forward. And there's controversy then, too, as, as to at which points in the Bible were they referring to a character named Satan or Satan meaning an adversary, you know, any adversary, yeah. just in the same way that uh, an antichrist was anybody who is anti-Christian and becomes this character, this individual character of the antichrist. So the, the only real coherent story of Satan, we feel, is the the literary Satan from Milton onward of the, the rebel angel against the ultimate tyranny. Okay. Definitely. God always seems yeah. like a dick. Oh yeah. 100% of the time, really. Yeah. Well, yeah. Especially the, the Job story. Uh, Satan comes out as a good guy. Yeah. The Job story is kind of hilarious if you break it down. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> he, you know, you see uh, this guy really is, really is doing, doing me really well. You know, this this guy's doing everything right, and Satan comes along and says, "Yeah, well, only because you're doing him right too." So he says, "You know what? Fuck that guy." So they go and <laughs> prod at him for a while, ruin his life just to see if, uh, <laughs> just to see where he stands after that. It's asinine. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> and it's not very good literature either. I mean, when it comes to the story of Satan, one of my favorite stories is "Revolt of the Angels" by Anatole France. No, okay. I mean, if you're going to get into literature, I yeah. just don't recommend the Bible. <laughs> <You Okay. know? laughs> and uh, does you, does your organization have any relationship to uh, Levain Satanism? Well, Levain did an important thing. I felt where he he really put forward uh, Satanism as atheistic you know, to a certain degree. There was still this talk of of ceremonial magic and that kind of thing. So there was still those elements of supernaturalism, but there was no. Uh, deity worship and really kind of cohered the idea that uh, a theistic Satan, Satanism of that type of worshiping a, a, an icon like that was was contradictory. And, and uh, that, that's something we're in agreement with. It's something that's been in our culture since we've grown up. But there's a lot of ways in which we depart from the Church of Satan and just about every other way we do. Uh, the Church of Satan really f- fetishizes authoritarianism. And I feel that that itself is contradictory to our view of Satanism as, you know, being the, the rebel angel against the ultimate uh, autocrat to begin with. Their, mm-hmm. their kind of fetishization of petty dictators and, and their uh, ideas about uh, the, what I would say are debunked ideas of social Darwinism, embracing that, uh, that kind of bastardized idea, the, the Spencerian idea of uh, survival of the fittest that really wasn't exactly what Darwin had ever put forward to begin with. And uh, that, that kind of Nietzschean idea that altruism doesn't exist and, and is something, uh, a byproduct of cultural weakness and that kind of thing, doesn't turn out to be true at all, but it's something they still kind of persist with. And they don't get involved in anything on a, on a politically activist level. They really hadn't done anything at the time when uh, the Satanic Panic was in full swing. And the Satanic Panic, if you're not aware, was this um, uh, moral panic throughout the 80s and 90s where there was these fears of Satanic cults encroaching in on good society and and murdering babies and uh, covering up the evidence with... Right, all that kind of thing. These these mythological Satanists that that never existed. But... um, but we we are very much active in all these things. We've only been around for a couple of years, but we, we really want to take the fight to the Satanic Panic purveyors, who are still quite in operation, um, if you're not aware. Uh, that's a whole other type of issue. But you've seen the, um, the political activism we do, and we think it's very important that we do so, rather than simply sitting back, calling ourselves Satanists, and allowing this, this kind of slander to befall us and... And really, when you do nothing, you kind of put credibility into the idea that Satanism uh, can be or is a problem. You know, if you if you don't do anything to educate the public on on what it actually means and what type of people actually gravitate to your belief system. No, from from uh, kids to adults, you guys have been pretty damn cool. I mean, like the the coloring book that was put out recently. Uh, 
that was just really cool and really cute. Well, in uh, we don't we don't advocate the proselytization to children. In fact, we don't put these things forward that we do in the hopes that we can draw in bigger membership. Uh, mm-hmm. Insofar as that that doesn't really doesn't really help us in any way and and nobody needs to be a member of the satanic temple or self-identify as a satanist to help us with any one of the campaigns that we do that they might agree with uh you know currently we have an indiegogo campaign running for legal aid for the uh, case in in missouri that we have where a woman's going to be using our exemptions from anti-abortion legislation in in missouri coming up and we will get people sending in donations and sending us commentary, sending us emails. And we even get people saying that they're Christian, but they agree with what we're doing on a constitutional level, which oh, wow. is kind of interesting the, the, how this uh, rests with some of the talking heads at Fox News or whatever else. Because I, I get those kinds of interviews sometimes too. And you can see that they have a difficult time grappling with... Uh, with the idea that we have the constitutional high ground. And they, they realize sometimes <laughs> that's dangerous territory for them. So oftentimes they, they'll, they're more likely to attack us on the grounds that we're openly atheistic. So therefore we must only be pranksters and not agree with, and not have any true belief in anything we're doing. So that's often, that's often what I get. You know, that's, <laughs> that's most of, uh, most of the criticism I feel is this idea that we're just, uh, this dipshit band of pranksters who are just fucking around and having a good laugh at everybody else's expense when clearly a lot of what we're doing isn't really isn't necessarily fun for us to jump in on you know the ultimate yeah. project a product might be fun like the children's book, big book of activities that we were doing as you mentioned yeah. but um rounding up the legal aid putting forward that kind of argument going through the bureaucracy to get to that point where they either have to um uh, to accept what we're doing it, there again with the case of the uh, of the activity book what was going on there in Florida was there was a school district that was allowing a evangelical group to hand out Christian materials to the children and we were making the case that if you're going to allow that and claim that it's an open forum of course you have to allow other religious voices in as well because they were saying this was an outside group it wasn't a school funded group this was an open forum you know so um we put together this activity book that was beyond reproach uh they they were hoping i'm sure that they could turn us down on on some community standards that we would put in something vulgar or offensive and that they could claim that that was the reason they were turning us down we didn't do that we we put forward a book that was very much just a standard activity book for kids but with satanic symbols and satanic iconography in it there was also there even a really strong anti-bullying ca- message in there, which was awesome. Oh, right, right. All that. But what I'm saying is there, yeah. there was no heavy-handed uh, religious philosophy in there. There wasn't oh, no. any pointing to, uh, to Satanism as the answer. There was no um, criticisms against Christianity offered in it. It was just, it was just a, uh, certainly a difficult <laughs> book to look at and claim that there was anything wrong or untoward from it. So they, they decided upon looking at it that really they couldn't turn it down without uh, <laughs> openly claiming viewpoint discrimination. So what they did instead was they turn, they uh, they shut down their open forum for religious materials. Which is perfect. Well, yeah, which caused a great deal of bitching and uh, complaining from the Liberty Institute, but, um, <laughs> but fuck them. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Yeah, if you ca- cared about their complaints, you probably wouldn't have gone with the name the satanic temple right exactly (laughs) they can cry all they want what's funny is the liberty institute i think is massively funded and and we're not you know but we just have a very solid argument to make in uh recently in arkansas a senator put forward a bill there claiming that uh he put forward a bill allowing for the construction of a ten commandments monument and the Mm -hmm. state property of 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 Arkansas. And, um, he puts forward this bullshit notion that, uh, the 10 commandments are what the constitution was based on, or, you know, either the state constitution of Arkansas or the United States constitution. In any case, 
the Ten Commandments was essential to the foundation of the United States of America, which is all just a total bunch of shit. Mm-hmm. But he actually wrote into the bill that if this is challenged, the, the Liberty Institute can uh, represent the state. And I think they're willing to do that <laughs> pro bono. And this might be a case where it's us against the Liberty Institute again, because uh, we are going to offer up a, a satanic monument to Arkansas um, in the same way we did to Oklahoma. And it looks like the the little prick who put the bill forward just kind of plagiarized the bill that was put forward in Oklahoma to begin with. Mm. <laughs> yeah, because it worked so well the first time. Well, it's worked so far, and we're still... Uh, we still need to file suit in Oklahoma and we have, uh, we've reached out to different lawyers and we have a a good lawyer right now who's looking it over, but hasn't, hasn't agreed to a retainer agreement yet. And he will within 30 days or so, but, um, you can expect that lawsuit to come up soon. And I think that will be another big bit of news when it does, because Mm -hmm. the monument's finished. The the completed photos of the Baphomet monument for Oklahoma haven't been released yet, but we'll release them when the news comes out that we've actually filed lawsuit against Oklahoma. And that'll be a very interesting case that has the potential for a Supreme Court battle. Yeah, that does. (laughs) Yeah, but any, any one of these things could be a massive precedent setting case. And, you know, the case in Missouri where the woman is, is presenting exemptions against the 72-hour waiting period and the informed consent materials. Those have never been challenged on religious grounds before. There's never been a religious group to say that these actually uh, conflict with, with their religious beliefs and that, uh, in, you know, our tenants hold that the body is inviolable, subject to one's own will alone, and we should be free to make our choices based upon the best scientific evidence available. And on both those grounds, we feel that the anti-abortion legislation in in Missouri fails us because the informed consent materials they provide are are government-sponsored informational materials that are scientifically inaccurate in many ways and are simply meant to dissuade a woman from abortion. And they have a 72-hour waiting period in place where the woman is meant to digest these materials when, in fact, it, it really puts in undue burden on her to have to wait for this abortion because there's only one clinic in Missouri and that three-day wait can mean uh, massive travel and expenses. You know, Mm -hmm. if you have to travel Mm -hmm. five hours to get to this clinic, you either have to stay overnight for a couple nights to to go through with your three-day waiting period or travel that twice. Either way, you're probably missing work or whatever else. So we're calling bullshit on that. And, um, we really thought lawyers would be scrambling to take up that challenge. It's, uh, you know, Missouri's also a riff for a state. We love hearing from our listeners. You can email us at contact at atheistnomads.com, tweet us at atheistnomads, send us a message on our Facebook page at facebook.com slash atheistnomads, or better yet, call us and leave us a message at 541-203-0666. We might even play it on the show. You can also help us out by leaving us a review on iTunes, Stitcher, or your podcast directory of choice. Um, If you're familiar with with RIFRA, it's the same uh, law that is the same act that was uh, that caused such a controversy in Indiana. You know, it's Mm -hmm. they're usually put forward under the idea that this prevents a baker from having to (laughs) bake a queer cake and, and. and stain his spiritual sanctity, you know, whatever. So I, I don't know why this concern for bakers all the time, but it's it's supposed to protect your religious belief from being encroached on by any uh, superfluous, arbitrary legislation. We feel that this is a perfect case in, in Missouri. We haven't gotten a response from the ACLU, so it doesn't look like we'll get pro bono support on this, but it's definitely a cause worth taking up. Yeah, oh, hell yeah. No, uh, bakers, I, I just think that, you know, they just have a bunch of really shitty bakers that just don't know how to make a proper rainbow cake. How often has it ever happened that a baker has run into this problem where a, where somebody comes in wanting some kind of homoerotic cake and they feel they just can't do it or, or Jesus won't love them anymore. I mean, what you have to wonder why in the fuck does this always come up? Why does this make any sense? They, uh, they presented the bill in, uh, Michigan, and, and they, they're still back and forth as to whether they're going to pass RIFRA or not. But when it was presented, 
it was presented with that that gay baker argument again, or or the non gay baker who has to make a cake for for queers. God forbid, you know. And now what's funny is um, since the Satanic Temple has gotten a good amount of press in in Michigan because we have a very strong Detroit chapter, a senator was recently doing a interview where he said that they they really need Rifra in Michigan in case the Satanic Temple comes in for a into a bakery wanting some kind of blasphemous cake made. So I thought, well, that's that's funny that now we can take the the primary spot over the the godless queers even though Rifra was <laughs> was something being touted before we were players in the game. Man, that that sounds like a gauntlet being thrown. You guys need to start getting it, it some does, cakes and, made. and we're we're it will take it up, right? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, the Detroit chapter did put out a uh and a, a, a petition for an amendment to RIFRA that if they're going to pass it, they should amend it to include a, uh, a discrimination transparency um, caveat where if a business is going to um, practice discrimination on religious grounds, they should have to openly state what that discrimination policy is in a conspicuous location. So, Definitely. you Make know, if you're going to go window. to... Exactly. So if, if, you know, the pizzeria like in Indiana says they can't, uh, they can't serve gays, then, um, they should, they should have to post on their window that they, they won't do business if it didn't serve homosexuals or whatever. Because, uh, you know, I feel that people shouldn't have to, uh, find that out after the fact. They shouldn't have to endure the waste of time or the humiliation of going mm-hmm. in and finding that they won't enjoy service. And somebody like me who's, he was, you know, not going to be affected by their stance. I would want to know anyway, so I know not to do business with that type of asshole. Yeah. Oh, definitely. And and just to make this feel just like it was in the you know forties, fifties, sixties, and and all that, all those years before that, where you know, right? You, you know, we've color, actually gotten color, the criticism color, with that I, with that phones. idea, saying, "Well, aren't you just pushing for a Jim Crow environment?" Yeah, and I was. Yeah, exactly. They should they should bear the shame of that. It wouldn't be us bearing the shame of that for bringing that out in the open. <laughs> you know, it's show us where you stand, and then yeah, and then we'll go from there. They're trying to create the environment. You're just trying to push them to actually fess up to put, it, admit to it, right? <laughs> yeah. right, exactly. I mean, you can't have it both ways. As bad as the Jim Crow era was, it would have been worse if they didn't label the discriminatory businesses. Right, right. They just wait for them to come in, place their yeah. order, and then say, oh, well, <laughs> sorry. Mob them with baseball bats, yeah. Yeah. Right, right. We don't serve your types, get out. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Exactly. Yeah, somebody wants to be a hateful prick, you might as well fucking own that shit. Right, right, exactly. And, and see, then, then see how the market responds. Exactly. I would love to vote with my dollars. Right. <laughs> like Indiana saw with the, the backlash they were getting. Oh, yeah. From a yeah, lot of, it's a lot funny of too. Yeah. Uh, but what's odd about that is, uh, you know, Indiana is not unique as a RIFRA state. Uh, it, RIFRA has been getting passed increasingly state to state. It was just finally people woke up with Indiana for some reason. I, I don't even know why. I, and then there I, was thought, this, this I thought Indiana's Rifra went a little bit further than the other ones. I think it did, but still, it's just as much an outrage anywhere. I, I don't know why the outrage wasn't wasn't as big anywhere else. When I mean, anytime you have senators putting forward a bill specifically because they're concerned that somebody might have to serve gays. Um, that's, a, that's a cause for outrage in and of itself, <laughs> you know, so I, I don't, I don't see Indiana being wholly unique in that way. And I think they, they kind of, uh, I think the response in Indiana kind of shut Michigan up a little bit, you know, the, the idiot who was making statements about the satanic temple did that. I think before the, the, uh, fury in Indiana and who knows where, where Michigan will go with this after that, but, but we'll see. <laughs> well, a little bit of pa- public shaming goes a long way. Well, we're showing them too that this stuff works the other way. You know, I, I it was it's funny because RIFRA federally was introduced, and the case was something like Native Americans wanting to use 
peyote as a sacrament and yeah. saying that, you know, the government had a burden to show that they really had some compelling need to keep them from doing that. And, um, and so it was meant to protect a minority group, right? And, and then some clever asshole came along and decided that Christians are being oppressed by having to serve gays. And so they, they try leveraging these different state RIFRA laws. So now I think we're getting back to the roots of RIFRA and, and reading it the way I feel it should be. And, and RIFRA doesn't necessarily have to be a bad thing. <laughs> you know, we have deeply held beliefs too. And I always think it's a mistake for uh, atheists to reject this notion we have of atheistic religion. You know, we're not the first religion to claim atheistic religion anyway. So, you know, there's plenty of recognized atheistic religions from Jainism to Confucianism to, you know, manifestations of Buddhism or, or whatever else. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, people don't, don't say that they're not a religion, but the, you know, the idea here is deeply held beliefs and that our values are are just as deeply held for not having a supernatural component. I would argue maybe even more so. We've thought these things out, you know, and we're not going to allow ourselves to be relegated some inferior status, uh, some some uh, situation in which we don't have the privileges and exemptions of the supernaturalists just because we're taking a stand against religion. I think it's time we think differently about how we define religion, and that's really that's really where we're going with this. Yeah, well, and especially in the the era of religious privilege we live in. Right, and uh, Jefferson was quite 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 clear in his writings that he felt religious opinion was to be protected, and that uh, and that whatever your religious opinion is, it shouldn't affect your civil capacities one way or another. And he even cited infidels as, as having this. Uh, in his biography, he was elaborating on this bill for religious freedom he had put forward in Virginia. And he was, you know, and he, he was clear to say that uh, that any religion, including the infidel, should have uh, equal access to any public services and that type of thing. So I, I really think we're... Uh, we're hitting the nail on the head far closer to the mark than uh, than any of these religious groups and their their very self serving interpretations of religious liberty. Well, and it was interesting recently with the uh, judge in, in Oregon ruling that humanism is a religion uh, as far as any legal look at it. Yeah, that was very interesting, and I didn't look at the commentary, but I was wondering if there were. Uh, many humanists and atheists who took exception to that because I see that kind of commentary sometimes from uh, different atheists saying that they 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 feel all religion is bad and all religion is wrong and that it's just a real travesty to be associated with religion in any way whatsoever. So I was wondering if there was that kind of commentary from from atheist groups uh, in revolt against this finding of humanism being a religion. But um, I think if you just change your terminology a bit and think of it as religious opinion, you know, mm -hmm. if you think about your deeply held beliefs and in, in the values that define you rather than um, rather than any supernatural component, which we, of course, openly reject, then that's a whole different story. And we should be approaching things this way. And, and it only benefits the opposition if we if we refuse to do that, if then we're handing them the whole the whole religion game and there are uh, legal privileges that go along with that that we should not concede and really i think if anything the past 10 20 years has taught us is that we cannot concede that that we're in a, we're in a desperate situation with the theocrats in office now there's definitely been a push and it's it's been a documented push in religious groups and organizations and trying to get uh their little mindless clones into political office and push a religious agenda. And we're seeing the product of that now. And, and I really, I, I really feel like it's getting worse and worse. I mean, this push for 10 commandments all over the place is push for in God, we trust plaques on every public building. And it's, it's, it's been wildly successful in a lot of ways. And, and, you know, I, I really think uh, that we're kind of a, last line of of defense or assault you know and we couldn't be more timely and 
you know, it's been a, a constant struggle for us ever since we jumped into the game. You know, there was that really nice, comfortable time when Bush, when Bush Jr. was in office and, you know, people were, you know, the Christians were bothered by us and, and basically everything was kind of, you know, they they were trying to push for Ten Commands um, monument and stuff like that for a while, but not too hard. But since Obama's been in and people have been pushing back, it seems like there's that really big rise up of it, of everybody just trying to trying to get their, yeah i don't know if it was a words cumulative everywhere. effect where they've just been emboldened uh progressively as they've gone on it doesn't really matter the president or if since obama came in there's that kind of apocalyptic fear that now this uh antichrist uh black muslim is in office and something must be done well maybe he's gonna just, take our, maybe, our guns all right they, they say that about every democratic candidate yeah so. <laughs> I, I think another factor is the the religious right is seeing their the youth leaving in droves. All conservative religion is seeing that right now, and well, liberal religion too. And it's they know they've got to they've got to act now, or they're not going to have a chance. Yeah, maybe that's it. And, and I hope their numbers are dwindling. I, I don't know. Um... I don't know if the important numbers are dwindling, though. You know, there, there's always, well, there, there's always the people polled and the people on the periphery. But when it comes to, you know, movers and shakers and people financing these types of activities of theirs, I don't really know. It's really hard to say. It's always disappointing to look back through the centuries, too, especially reading literature from the 1800s and, or, you know, the 1700s. But, um, you know, the, the authors I'm finding talking about Christianity being in its death throes and the death of superstition in general and, you know, the new age of enlightenment and all that. And it's just, it just never seemed to come. It's like the second coming. <laughs> mm. <laughs> it never, never arrived. I don't know. I really don't know what to make of it. I, I hope we're in a situation where this, this is the death throes and we can count on, on, um, on this kind of, uh, this kind of theocratic behavior receding in our lifetime, but I don't think it's with, with a big I think business. It still needs to be fought, you know. We, oh, we yeah. need to fight it. It definitely needs to be fought, but I, I think the way that big business has tied its its talons into religious, uh, uh, well, religion really, uh, I don't think it's going to be going anywhere for a while. Yeah, no, no, I think you're right, and I think um, I think if uh, fifty years ago. You were to, if you were able to go back fifty years ago and tell somebody that the internet was going to was going to take over much of people's daily lives, that this, all this information was going to be accessible, encyclopedic knowledge, I think uh, a lot of people then would have said, "Well, that is going to be the death of religion. That's uh, that that it can't stand. Superstition can't stand at that point when you have." Uh, effects at your fingertips like that and we find of course that they're wrong you know um we find with all the information available people now gravitate more tribally towards absolute bullshit and and you know of course now i'm thinking of fox news and, and other non-news venues like that you'd think this kind of access would give us uh improved news sources but it seems to have the exact opposite effect so I really don't have a solution to that one, but it's just an interesting little cultural fun fact, it seems. Yeah, we, we definitely do have to fight, because uh, if we don't, we might end up seeing a third Great Awakening, and that would really suck. Now, if you look at the, yeah. what you're talking about with the Enlightenment, what uh, re rec the way Christianity recovered from that was the first Great Awakening, and then we had the you know like the, the era of the, the Founding Fathers. Uh, deism was on the rise. Until the second Great Awakening, <laughs> and I really hope that doesn't repeat itself. Well, what's horrifying is we're, they're actively engaging in 
in a revisionism of history right now to a, to a very strong degree. Like I mentioned the, the bill put forward in support of the Ten Commandments monument in Arkansas, but you read the bill itself, it, it is full of bullshit history that just simply isn't true about the founding of the United States, the place of the Ten Commandments and how the Ten Commandments was foundational in, in American law. And it just, it's just not true. And they feel like if they pass a bill, my feeling is they feel like if they pass a bill in which they've put this down on paper as fact, they feel like they've made it a fact, you know? And then we hear about in Texas, them trying to put forward these uh, new textbooks where you have Moses as a founding father. I mean, that's... It's somewhat hearsay because I haven't seen the actual text that they're going to put in the uh, in the textbook. Sometimes I see that people overblow these kinds of things, but insisting on uh, on uh, mention of Moses in any case to do with the United States is is certainly going too far, and and that's just you know it's it's just very scary to let those kinds of things stand. You know, this kind of miseducation of the youth to the benefit of one religious group. It's just intolerable. Mm hmm. They're doing serious revisionist history on Thomas Jefferson or just trying to remove him whole cloth. It, oh, you can see why. Kind of I mean, sick. <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, well, Jefferson had a lot of great things to say about religion that just don't fit with, you know, with with their concept. And as I said, his ideas on religious liberty were, were very clear. Uh, he was talking about religious opinion and even that of the infidels. So, but you can't... You can't write Moses or, yeah, I believe it's Moses into the, uh, into American history any more than you can write Jefferson out of it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, and what's funny is they've, they've stopped trying to shield it as just being historical great lawmakers. They don't bother with putting Hammurabi in there anymore. Exactly. And that, that was a, an argument I was making in regards to the Ten Commandments in in Arkansas, because it's funny, this little prick, this senator, Jason Rappert in, uh, in Arkansas, he was, of course, saying that this isn't any way a religious statement. Though, if you look at his Twitter feed, which I'm blocked from now, he, <laughs> um, he, he has Bible verses every day and, and obviously very much putting forward a Christian message. But this has nothing to do with, with that. So why not choose an earlier legal code that... Um, that predates the Ten Commandments and, and, and uh, quite arguably inspired most of the Ten Commandments as it was and are more rational. But uh, aside from that, to say that the Ten Commandments had anything to do with constitutional law, well, why isn't anything unique to the Ten Commandments anywhere in the Constitution, in any state constitution or U.S. Constitution? And plus, there are no constitutional prohibitions against murder and theft and the, the only things people cite about the Ten Commandments is having any use in law anyway as part of common law. And it just seems that it's, it's complete ignorance on the part of these lawmakers. They don't even seem to realize that. They bring things into argument that aren't even there. And I honestly think they're, they're stupid. I, was, uh, I came into this thinking that I was going to be dealing with politicians who were uh, very well versed in debate, that... At the end of the day, I was going to have a difficult time uh, debating politicians in public because, you know, they, they're playing to a market. You know, they might not necessarily believe these things, but they know how to present them and they're playing to a base, uh, you know, some certain constituency that they need to manufacture their arguments for. I'm beginning to think that that's not the case anymore. It may have been the case before. I talked to some of these guys. They're genuinely fucking stupid. You should see a debate I did with uh, with a representative from Oklahoma about our monument, uh, Paul Wesselhoff. Uh, I came in there thinking I really had to have my I really had to have my shit together because you know here was a here's a politician of however many years, this guy's ancient, and he came on there and he just I have to say I made I made a fool of this old man and and rightfully so, but um, you know I, I think we're we're being overrun by fools. If you like this show, consider giving us some financial support. We make it really easy with one-time donations or to support us on a per-episode, monthly, or even annual basis using PayPal or Patreon. Find out more at AtheistNomads.com. 
use the links on the right side of the page. One dollar an episode is all we ask. Please think of the kittens. People seem to want to vote for a fool. Hmm. Yeah. In way too many states. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the, the Christian universities, you know, the, the, the big ones, uh, I, I guess they have to give up on science. You know, you're not going to find evolutionary biology classes. But from what I understand is they're really, really try, They really do their best to prime the kids to go into politics, to go into law and go in there and really push forward this uh, this kind of brain dead agenda to uh, promote their religion. Well, what do you what do you expect? I mean, it's not like they can win on the science. All right, they they have to they have to bypass that entirely. I mean, occasionally you'll get like one or two like really serious creationists that'll go through biology or geology and and come out with a you know a, a certificate saying they actually passed. Uh, most of those kind of fail miserably once they see that you know what they've been taught all their lives is just fucking bullshit. Yeah, it really does take a certain brand of of disingenuous fool to uh to hold on to it who's one of them william dembski is that his name whoever made a testimony about Mm -hmm. his his big idea about irreducible complexity which was really brought to trial in the uh in in kansas and failed but um you know you try to understand a guy like that and think does he really believe the bullshit he's saying and it's, I, I still can't figure it out. <laughs> you know, I, I, I deal with these people all the time and I, I still have difficulty measuring their their sincerity and authenticity, which is funny because people look to us, the Satanic Temple, and they, it seems they're always trying to measure our sincerity and authenticity because we're upfront about being atheist, because we're really upfront about our arguments. And I, I feel like, uh, you know, it's just such a different way of thinking for them. And this idea of non-theistic Satanism, they feel could only be a joke. You know, it's shocking. It's it's something that, uh, you know, stirs up a lot of uh, controversy and in reaction. So therefore, any one of these things is is all it's about. You know, we're we're only doing it for the reaction where, you know. We say, you know, we say we're atheists, so therefore we're only atheists. We're not Satanists. You know, the, the philosophy can't mean anything to us. Uh, that metaphorical construct doesn't actually mean anything beyond the pranksterism. So the, the question of authenticity arises all the time. And yet I'm always looking at the other side, wondering how much of this do they actually believe and how much of it is just convenient for them. Well, I, when I was in the seminary, I, I and I, for, for your your information, I, I got a bachelor's degree in theology from an Adventist university, and then I went to the Adventist uh, seminary, and I, I dropped out halfway through my Master of Divinity, and I was made a point of talking to the professors that, based on what they said, I could tell they, they had gone through similar doubts that, that I was dealing with, and what I found talking to each one was that they knew the facts, and they knew the facts didn't match up with what they believe. But they accept what they believe on existential grounds. Right. Okay. Yeah. And I, I feel that I honestly have to feel that that's not a healthy way to to carry out your Mm-mm. your mental life. I mean, I mean, it may work in certain ways for some people and it clearly does, you know, in, in a lot of ways. But I think ultimately, you know, that kind of divided self is a uh, is a poor idea. Yeah. And I, I spoke to a Catholic uh minister one time and he was actually quite open about the fact that he didn't believe in any of it anymore and it it had been a long time since he believed in any of it but the way he explained it to me was simply that that was the path he'd taken when he was much younger and it was really too late to turn back and i really wonder how often that's the case that's really sad yeah oh the clergy project last i heard they had over 300 members that's 300 that pastors that don't believe. Oh, the clergy, it's for, it's for atheistic pastors? Yeah. I'm not familiar with this. Oh, yeah, the clergy project, it's, uh, it's for, yeah, pastors that don't believe anymore to have a... A safe place to talk. Yeah, a safe place to talk with people that have been there before 
and to try to help figure out ways to get out of it. Yeah. Find him a secular oh, job. Wow. Yeah. Um, that was something that uh, Dennett helped get going. Mm-hmm. Him and Teresa McBain and Jerry DeWitt were a couple of the uh, first people out of that. Oh, well, so they, they realized there was a market there. Yeah, d- yeah, that does not surprise me. Yeah, and, well, like, okay, I've I've been through a lot of those same classes, and there's, if you actually take it seriously, your studies, I don't get how you can come out the other end and still believe. I really don't. <laughs> well, I would have thought, yeah, I've never been through some. Seminary. So I would have thought they would have kind of manufactured the education to go the other way. So so what exactly was it matching up for you? I mean, would, did you have to take standard history lessons and in, in other types of uh, educational courses that contradicted your your theological teachings? Uh, well, I did have to take all the standard uh, uh, general type courses, but it was it was the theology classes that you know when you're studying it that deep. You can't not see the contradictions. Oh, right. So you were seeing the internal inconsistencies yeah. themselves. Yeah. Right, right. And one of the most damning classes was a class on, on it was basically a, a creationist propaganda class. And it was amazing looking around at the faces of the other students in that class and how many people were just like, holy shit, we've got nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Well, yeah, are you familiar with the writings of Bart Ehrman? Yeah, a little bit. Well, he was uh, you know, he clearly majored in theology. I'm not sure to uh, you know which direction he was in, but he, he's done really in-depth scriptural analysis, and he's clearly not a believer now, and writes mm-hmm. these books that really really pull the entire thing apart and shows exactly where the contradictions are, and you know where the uh, differences in translation come in that really took off into another direction, all those types of things. Really, really interesting material. But yeah, you, you'd think, uh, you'd think that teaching would turn out a lot more. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's, but there are some people that they, okay, there, there was a decent number of people I was going to school with that weren't that bright. Uh, they, they <laughs> struggled through the Greek. But that, that's they, true. That's true of any school though. Yeah. <laughs> Struggled through the Greek, but they got through it. But there's there's the ones that they just have to pretend. Yep. They somehow managed to live with the cognitive dissonance. So how did how did you come out of it? Was it was it painful or did you have other good options lined up? Were you able to kind of seamlessly transition into another field? Oh horribly painful. I actually dropped out uh Four sermons in on a 22-part evangelistic series in Mexico. So I wasn't even in the country when it, when I crashed and burned. And uh, then I couch hopped for a month and found a job. And did you have to kind of reconsider a good number of things you thought were wrong or right, uh, even outside of the religious teaching? Like, say, oh, everything. for example, issues related to premarital sex and that type, and gays and that kind of thing? Yeah. Yeah, it, I had see, to see this might might be an issue of uh, of imprinting and timing, because if you had come across atheistic Satanists in that time, you know, living a what would have seemed like a responsible hedonistic lifestyle and telling you there's nothing wrong with this or that in. Yes, this is blasphemous, you know, this this symbolism or whatever. But that's the point. You may have really latched onto that that might have mm-hmm. been something you really gravitated toward and then you could see how this could be very genuine for somebody despite the appearance of just raw pranksterism you could see that this could be a culture of its own you know that this could oh, yeah. construct somebody's cultural identity the type of thing that we're doing so i say that in effort to try to uh get people to understand where we're coming from because that that always is the question you know yeah. The authenticity, yeah. the, the why is it why is it Satanism and why not some other some other word or, or form or, or voice that could be uh, less controversial to people as though we were averse to controversy. Mm-hmm. But um, <laughs> well, but hopefully that, for some of your listeners that gives a deeper understanding. Well, in my own experience, if since really the last thing I had to let go of was the fear that Satan was deceiving me, if I had just switch that to Satan was liberating me. 
I would have been a Satanist. Right. Right. Exactly. Yeah. That minor of a difference. Right. Oh, that, and, that's uh, a hell of a switch right there, though. <laughs> <laughs> it is and it isn't, you know, um, because uh, we've had it said before that, uh, you know, our Satan is just somebody else's Christ. You know, right. and I, I in I don't uh, I don't reject that because I think that's an important thing for somebody to realize, too. But, uh, of course, saying you're a Christian, saying you're an adherent to Christ's teachings, um, I think is, is not, is definitely not as strong, definitely not as liberating because you have that moral self-licensing that goes along with that. Not sure if you're aware of that term, but look up the term moral self-licensing and they've done a good number of studies that find that people who define themselves in terms of moral superiority often uh, give themselves license to act like pricks in, in openly immoral ways. So you have people who have this belief that they have this moral high ground, and so they feel it gives them license to act like act like pricks. And I think we see that a lot of times with Christian groups. They're 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 good people because they define themselves in the top uh, in, the, in the terms the symbolic terms of of uh, moral superiority. And I think you see that kind of uh, that kind of thing at play when you look at a case like uh, this woman who vandalized our holiday display in Florida. Are you aware of that case? Yeah, this that past, weird, uh, crazy cr- yeah, Catholic yeah. batshit lady. Yeah, j- yeah, and just this, uh, just this week here, we get news that she started another GoFundMe campaign mm-hmm. where she's claiming that we we ruined her life, helped her lose her job, and all these things. Completely untrue. We've had no contact with this woman or her employer whatsoever. We weren't even the ones bringing, bringing suit against her. It was the state. And they dropped the charges. <laughs> and she's claiming that this, this case has cost her everything and that she needs a handout. And uh, it, what's funny is you see this kind of like Catholic news service and different agencies, uh, Glenn Beck, you know, applauding this woman for her, her petty vandalism, for her, her criminal behavior that she entirely got away with and is now asking for a paycheck upon. And I think only... Only in this this context, when you're looking at things in these symbolic terms of religion, would you take the side of somebody engaging in the way she did against us, engaging, uh, you know, behaving in the way that we are, and, and imagining that she has the the moral high ground, the upper gra- upper hand on this. When but that, the, that's kind the of one the thing that she, distorted thinking. The one yeah. thing that she clearly needs is medication, though, not a handout. <laughs> right. Oh, right. Yeah, there's, there seems to be something wrong with her. But these people, they, they only emboldened her, you know, and when they and when the state uh, and when the prosecutor for the state decided to drop the charges for no good reason at all, um, you know, they, they just further gave her this idea that she had done nothing inappropriate at all. Well, one of the most <laughs> dangerous things out there is a mentally ill person who finds God instead of a good doctor. Yeah. Yeah, we've seen that time and again. <laughs> Man, I keep hearing your cat, and mine's just sleeping in my lap. <laughs> just saying. <laughs> yeah, my my cat, uh, my cat, uh, hell of a has motor. tried to destroy a couple interviews of mine that I've done via Skype. I believe it was uh, Tom Hartman. I was on his show when I was doing it through Skype, and that was just the time my cat decided to run across my. Uh, my table and knock shit on the floor. It's like she knows. She knows what I'm doing in an interview. There's other times she, I've been in the room and got everything set, you know, and then I get on Skype doing an interview and she'll just find a bag or something and just start crinkling it just to make as much noise as she possibly can. <laughs> I don't know. She's, she's really got a talent. She really seems to realize what's going on and when, when, when to do these things, when, ex- when is exactly the wrong moment. So she should, so she should make a spectacle of herself. Nice. Wow. I think the worst my dogs have done was went from laying quietly on the floor while we're recording to gnawing out a bone really hard right against the floor. <laughs> Making a very loud <laughs> clicking sound every time. <laughs> All right. So we've, we've been talking about what's going on in the world a lot. Uh, you would like, couple of your favorite movies what do you like to do what do you what do you do in your spare time do you have spare uh, time 
No, I really don't. <laughs> really, <laughs> this I was talking about uh, some of the commentary acting like, uh, you know, I think there's this perception about how fun this must be. It's only fun in retrospect, you know, if something works <laughs> out. But like this past couple of weeks, this desperate struggle to get a, a lawyer in line for Missouri yeah. because, um, y- you know, it, we just didn't anticipate the difficulty getting a lawyer. And we, we end up looking quite bad if we are not able to come through on our argument. It looks like we have everything cleared up now. But that just happened this evening. You know, it was a couple of weeks of being on the phone and being uh, kept on the line by the ACLU claiming they'd get back from us and then not responding to the calls at all to, you know, finally getting uh, a paid lawyer lined up to work on this. So that that's really... That's really all my time. <laughs> At least it has been for the past couple of weeks, and it's kind of hard for me to get out of that mindset now. But um, one day, I'd like to step back a bit and just be a fat fucking slob and play <laughs> video games and, you know, just let it all pass me by for a little bit. Oh, right now, that, though, I've, really got, I've got things to do. So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, eventually I want to be one of those guys who can sit back on his laurels. Mm. And have underlings doing your bidding. What about the yeah. uh, SPLC, the so- Southern Poverty Law Center? Do you ever help with something like that? Maybe. Yeah. I haven't tried them. We tried a lot of the reproductive rights centers. And, and, you know, everybody kept trying to bounce us back to the ACLU. And we had a c- contact with the ACLU who over the weekend said he was actually going to be working on this. And that this was, you know, that this all looked good and was a good case to him. And ever since, he's been on a conference call 24 hours a day. So clearly, he doesn't want to talk to us. I kind of get the impression that the ACLU, for whatever reason, doesn't want to take the case. But they also don't want to say that they're not going to take the case. You know, I think it's just kind of a a playing politics thing where they're not sure how this will work out. Maybe, Maybe from a PR perspective or one way or the other. So they don't want to say that this was something they wouldn't touch. You know, they don't want to speak against it, but they're not going to take it. Hmm. But them not, a, not coming out and saying that to us has kind of held us up and put us in a real bad spot. The Southern Poverty Law Center is supposed to specialize in civil, civil rights and public interest uh, litigation. So, yeah, yeah. So they thing. should. They, yeah, they should probably have a presence in Missouri. We had to have made a million calls in the past couple of weeks, though. But um Maybe there's somebody we can bring on. Maybe they're people we can go to after the fact. What we really need to be ready for is when she goes to the clinic, mm-hmm. which is is coming up, uh, then um, she needs to present the exemptions. And when those exemptions are likely refused, we have to be able to file right then. You know, So there's a very a limited time frame we had to work with here. We need to file for injunctive relief is what it's called saying that this these waivers need to be respected and so you know now we have somebody paid to put this together and file it but um hopefully that doesn't hurt our chances of well it it won't we can we can convert over to pro bono at any time then but as for now we have to we have to pay up to lawyer up and that's what we're doing Why can't we just be more like fucking Northern Europe? <laughs> oh, shit. That is the big question. Why are we the, uh, the one nation that is the most ostensibly secular on paper and we're dealing with this bullshit more so than, than states that, or nations that have far more uh, or far less secular constitutions? Mm. Yeah. Damn. Ah. <laughs> uh. Man, you're all right. Wasn't sure what to expect. Cause... <laughs> well, I, I hope what you got was something coherent because, uh, you know, like <laughs> oh, I said, yeah. I've been on the phone for the past couple of weeks now. Has, haven't really had social dialogues. And now I think I'm just pouring, pouring shit out. And I'm not sure if it's cohering into a, <laughs> into a linear narrative or not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I always think of, you know, sorry, but, you know, whenever I think of Satanists, the first thing that comes to my mind is always Anton and his uh, kind of, uh, oh, shit, I totally lost it. Uh, he looks like uh, the the guy from, oh, fuck me. Flash Gordon. Gordon, yes, thank you. 
<laughs> I always wanted. I always hoped they'd make a remake and he'd be in it. <laughs> well, God. no chance of that now. Yeah, no, definitely. <laughs> he had that that weird persona, kind of, kind of, kind of the same. Yeah, Man. bald head, the goatee, kind of uh, defined. Uh, well, it's funny when I first started doing press, and and there first started being video images of me online. I remember some of the first commentary was people saying, oh, that guy doesn't look like a Satanist to me. And now I see the exact opposite. I see a lot of commentary saying, well, this guy really looks the role. And I think people's kind of expectations and perceptions change. You know, <laughs> I don't, I don't know. I saw it on, online, somebody, uh, somebody in the comments was saying I should play uh, Lucifer or whoever else in the Constantine show or movie or if there's, you know, there's that, I don't know. I don't know what it is, but some kind of, some kind of show or movie where, where Satan or Lucifer plays a, plays a role. And somebody thought I would have, be the perfect image for that. And I thought that's kind of an interesting change in perspective. Mm hmm. I don't know. I mean, whenever I think of Satan though, you know, okay, I'm going to go back a little bit because you guys were talking about, you know, the, the flip. If, if Dustin, if you would have just said that, you know, Satan was my homeboy. Mm-hmm. You know, everything would have been a lot better. You would have come out as Satanist, probably, but still. No, I wouldn't um, say everything would have come out better. It just would have been a little bit different. Well, oh. minorly different. Just you know, would have got I, a different I, label. Yeah, I came out thinking that it was all just complete bullshit, and hell really didn't give me any any warm fuzzies or bad feelings, really. But you know, now that I think back on Satan. He's, he's, you know, not that bad of a guy. <laughs> if I was going to be friends with one of them, he would be the one. Uh, yeah, he has, uh, has a far lower body count, that's for sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, and especially when you look back at the, the historical development of that, that character in the Bible, Satan doesn't first show up until... Okay, debatably, which would be first would either be Chronicles or, or Job, uh, but it's not until after the exile, and that's that's late. So there's a lot of stuff that if they'd written this, written those texts later, they would have been attributing to Satan and not God. Instead, they just let God be both the good guy and the horrible, horrible asshole. Right, right, and that that was supposed to that was what it was supposed to be. He was he was everything. He was. There was some kind of comment, I forget now which of the books, but God describing that I am the darkness and the light and I am the good and evil, all that kind of thing. So it was really with the, the demonology of the Christians. And, and that kind of thinking is that the psychology is common in any any fringe religious sect. I mean, it's easy to see Christianity coming up as a cult within within Judaism at a certain point in time. That, that really that idea that they they really had the answer and that the world was against them and you mm-hmm. know and then you have this dualism God and Satan and and Christ was the the one the one savior against Satan that type of thing and it's it's funny you know just even even approaching theology from a psychological standpoint you would think that it, it would do much to debunk it I, I can never understand how people retain their their faith in any case, no matter what their primary area of study is. You know, I think any kind of detached view and you'll see it for what it is. Yeah. Well, I'm thinking about that Terry Gilliam movie, time bandits, you know, God created the pure and concentrated evil and you know, it's all his fucking fault. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> well, all you have to look exactly. at is the garden of Eden, the, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The, literally, the tree of knowledge was the the evil temptation. Yeah, don't yeah. learn. Yeah, but there again, it's only later on that people interpreted the snake to be Satan. Mm-hmm. Whereas in the in the book, it's just it's just another talking snake. Yeah, you know, common common in those days. Sure. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Talking snakes, talking donkeys. Yeah, sure. Yeah, and it's just slithering around said hey why don't you get yourself some knowledge much to god's discontent (laughs) (laughs) well and if you look at the the curse on the snake 
it wasn't just slithering around. It either had legs or wings. Because part of the curse is that it would have to crawl on the ground on his belly. <laughs> yeah. And so apparently... Just, it, in the same way that now we're to believe that uh, dinosaurs were vegetarians until yeah. until the fall. Yep. D- despite the big claws and the teeth and the the obvious carnivorous construct, they, <laughs> they were... They were vegetarians until this evil befell the world. Come on, the Flintstones was real. You know, we were riding them fuckers. <laughs> All right, well, we are about out of time. Yeah, man. Oh, boy. So, Lucian, what uh, what do you have to plug? Well, oh, I guess right now the uh, the legal fund we're trying to round up for our fight against the anti-abortion legislation i mean this is a nationwide fight we're just testing it you know the missouri is the testing grounds because we have this subject actually using our our uh, exemptions very soon so you'll you're likely to see a lot more news about that so um please check out our our indiegogo fund for that we offer different perks different uh different products for donations and it's it's bracketed by whatever amount that that donation is in but believe me that will all go towards this campaign and um it's a bit more poignant now because our uh Oklahoma also just passed a 72 hour waiting period and state by state they're just doing everything they can to make it impossible to get an abortion and this really needs to be brought to a stop, you know, and, and I feel like we stand the best chance of grinding this bullshit to a halt. You know, finding these bypasses is 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 exactly what we need to do. So that's really what I have to plug right now. It's kind of a desperate state of affairs for that because we have to round up some serious cash to put this forward. Like I said, we're not getting pro bono support. So, <laughs> so uh, check us out. Go to our Go to our website or, or check out uh, Facebook. We update there often with our, our news and our campaigns and reports and everything. And um, it's free to be a member of the Satanic Temple. We think it's a little backward to ask people to pay for their religious affiliation. So you just sign up online and you you can get our newsletter too. And we'll keep you up to date with things there. Badass, man. Lucian, it's been a pleasure, man. Thank yeah. you for coming on. Yeah, thank, thank you, you very much, and uh, keep up the good work. Yeah, yeah, and uh, feel free to check back in with me anytime for an update. All right. Satan willing, you'll continue to keep doing good works. Yeah, that'll at least give us lots of, of good news to be able to report. Good news and good chuckles. I, I promise you that. I am going to keep on. Awesome. All right, well, and thank you very much. All right, thank you. I will. I will talk to you guys soon. All right, and for our listeners, we will be back uh, next week with news. Thank you for listening to another episode of Atheist Nomads. You can find us online at www.atheistnomads.com, contact us at contact at atheistnomads.com, or leave us a voicemail message at 541-203-0666. You can also like us on Facebook or leave us a review on iTunes, Zoom, or wherever else you find the podcast. Until next time, this has been The Atheist Nomad.